Good morning, everybody. So I'm not going to um, introduce people because I think you've seen their names and their titles, and you can see exactly why um, they're relevant to this conversation. I think it's a fantastic selection we have coming from different aspects of our data ecosystem, and we very much look forward to hearing from them. What I'm going to say as an introduction is that we we want to hear from them the state of the present, but that gives us a taste of the past and a taste of the future, if I'm allowed to. Um, we're not going to do an SLA. We're going to do a WTF. But anyway, um, <laughs> oh, no, a soft systems. Anyway, we'll learn the uh, we'll learn the terminology as we go along, um, but feel at ease. And we want to hear about your realities, not necessarily the the theory, not necessarily the myth of how data works, how data changes things, how data is influential, but the reality of how maybe it doesn't always work or you're missing the key bit or getting your message across uh, is takes more than just numbers and, and images. So um, I'm going to ask each of the four uh, panelists to introduce themselves a little bit and to speak for maybe five minutes on, on what they're working on in the present and how that um, informs their view of the uh, data, humanitarian data ecosystem, and then we'll move to a discussion, and then we'll see, um, we'll see how we how we end up. Uh, and if you want to jump in, I will try and include you as well. So first of all, we'll start with uh, Asil Zidane from the Palestine Bureau of Statistics. We are um, thrilled to have her here, and we are very grateful that she could spare the time in what must be a very painful and and difficult time. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Asil Zidani from Palestinian Center of Statistics. I'm active directorate for prices and indices department. Especially I working in, in short term indicators, uh, producing consumer price index and other indices such as industrial production index, wholesale and construction one. I am a national coordinator for international comparison program and on harmonized consumer price uh, index. Okay, so, and in your in your current work with the crisis in Gaza, how does that affect your current work and how does it relate to your normal work in the West Bank and in the past? Yes. Uh, right now, everything is a stop in Gaza Strip uh, because the war uh, since uh, 7th of October 2023. Uh, just we are working in West Bank, in whole governorate in, uh, side gover in the inside West Bank. Uh, all surveys uh, are planned to be collecting every data there. Uh, but in Gaza Strip, uh, after the war is stopped, uh, we uh, should make a listing for every buildings, every land, uh, every people there uh, to make a planning what we can do after that. Uh, because uh, there is a uh, huge number of injured persons, killed one, uh, many buildings destroyed there. Uh, so uh, to collect a sample, to do any surveys, we need to make a listing and mini census uh, to start any survey there. Who, who are your customers? If we divide this panel into producers and consumers, I, I guess you're a producer of data. Yeah, we are a producer for a different type of data to uh, using these numbers in a decision maker for different types of people or institutional or international uh, organizations such as uh, OCHA, UN OSQUA, uh, also uh, UN SAT, uh, or also uh, International Monetary Funding, World Bank, uh, etc. So I'm going to ask you one more question. I'm sorry to grill you, but um, it's obviously very much on our minds, uh, the situation. So I saw one of your data sheets said that you had a 1,000% increase in wheat and the price of wheat in Gaza. Tell us how you collect that information. Yeah, we collect different type of prices by uh, directly uh, calling uh, every field workers there in uh, different uh, governorate in Gaza Strip from north one to the south one. Uh, we are uh, calling them every day to collect different type of prices for different commodities consumed by uh, households there. Uh, we focus on uh, 
the basic commodities there such as rice, wheat, uh, oil, uh, also uh, we uh, about mineral water there, uh, medical uh, commodities, uh, uh, everything they can buy by uh, the field worker there. Uh, they also ask uh, different households, uh, their neighborhood, to the field workers in the UN schools uh, shelters, you know. Uh, so we uh, get this data from there and uh, making it for it uh, and build the consumer price index and uh, make the inflation rates. Uh, it's from 7 October until end of May, about 20-40% increase in the prices in there in Gaza Strip especially in food prices and uh, housing one and uh, also in transportation. Yes, that's um, got some dramatic numbers. Maybe Dirk, you could also give us an intro on what your, how you see the humanitarian picture after your years, different varied experiences. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so I'm Dirk Sega, the International Director for the Netherlands Fed Cross. Um, I mean, data is extremely important, and now I used to work at uh, at the UN, at uh, at OCHA. Uh, at uh, it was very much at the at the beginning, supporting the vision of uh, of Sarah Telford and CJ Andrew and others. Uh, you know, where we were actually in the communication and information services branch of uh, of OCHA in in New York, and we just saw that our information products. And you were head of the, I think, the reporting unit at the time, uh, Sarah. Um, that you know the reporting products that we had were just not very good um and uh, so our first solution also because it was part of the communication department as well was just let's make them more pretty yeah, so we looked at all these uh, situation reports and you know decide a a, a format that is all for everybody is the same and a nice picture same structure so that it looked better but you know very soon after sarah still came to me and said from look uh, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out. Basically, the data that we're getting is so bad and so ad hoc and so different from different sources. And it, there's no timeline in it that is, you know, that you can look at trends over time. It's just not working. And we're getting it from so many different actors, you know, from the role of OCHA. Uh, you know, we need to do something about it. And that's where the whole journey started that uh, ended up in the, you know, Center for Humanitarian Data. Now, so I think data is in extremely important. And now in the Netherlands Red Cross, we uh, have set up a, a, eight years ago um, a very large now data and digital team called 510. Some colleagues are, are here. In fact, the founder is here, Martin van der Veen. Uh, so do speak to him. But uh, in eight years, we went from one FTE to 60 FTE uh, and then, you know, a whole range of uh, volunteers. So I think the team is about 100. Uh, now, so that shows, you know, for a relatively small national society like the Netherlands Red Cross, how important this really, really is. And of course, you know, we don't want to, we don't just work within a silo. We really work with the whole movement. We're supporting about 50 or so national societies every given year, uh, a lot on on, on cash, especially the, the data management piece behind uh, cash distribution uh, systems. It's, it's really taking a flight. Cash in general, obviously, it's taking a flight, but the, 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 the data piece behind it is super important. But also a big priority is uh, anticipatory action, uh, um, uh, impact-based forecasting. So we're working with quite a few uh, national societies and the authorities to Look at historical disaster data, uh, set triggers. Look at uh, you know the uh, the hazards, the uh, exposure of communities, vulnerabilities, uh, and then try to you know link that to to early action. Eh? And uh, you know, for example, in the Philippines, with Philippines Red Cross, we started working with them, set those things with authorities, was relatively successful. But then also you saw that you're very much in in silos again. And by working actually with OCHA, we were able to open that up to further develop it and open it up to the all humanitarian communities, so we're all working, you know, from the same song sheet. Um, so there's a lot more I, I can tell, but what I do see is that, you know, as, as a sort of a, a first start of this uh, this conversation, is that we still work way too much in in silos, um, and that we really to really be effective with data, and especially I'm always interested in the the link to decision makers. Uh, you know, I really want to see impact at that level. That you know that we make more data-driven decisions uh, and that it really lands. 
uh, and there um, there are a lot of challenges there and I think the credibility of the data is super important so we need to make sure that we bring from many more different sources than we do now that really helps to 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 build that credibility we need to ground truth that data as well that really uh, with local experts and local uh, data local organizations to make sure it's not just global data sets etc it needs to have that ground truthing and then the communication piece is uh, is super important it's just storytelling if you just data itself is nothing as far as i'm concerned it's an unpopular probably thing to say here but you know if you talk about decision making data will not go anywhere uh, you know it, uh, there's two really important pieces. Uh, for me, actually, there's a golden triangle with with data. It's data, it's people, it's money. And those three need to be connected to really make an impact. And if you talk on the people side, uh, you need to, a, a lot part is storytelling. So the data needs to be translated into a story that makes sense to decision makers hey, and that has the urgency uh, to then uh, influence decisions. But also listening is, is actually, you know, that almost goes before it because too often data is, is sort of projected onto people and storytelling is projected onto people. But you first need to understand where people are coming from, but also where decision makers are coming from. So you need to have the data at the ground level from communities, etc., to to understand uh, the data and the story and the impact of it. But also you need to have that listening to really pits your story towards decision making decision makers in in a way that it lands uh, uh, with with them so also with our 510 data digital team of the Netherlands Red Cross we do a lot of work on uh, around uh, community engagement and accountability for example to make sure that uh, that we that we are listening um, um, yeah to make sure things land I must stop there thanks a lot when, when you say silos is it the is it the data people are a silo who aren't properly integrated with the rest of the thing? I mean, all data people, they are working within institutions, uh, right? And so that I think it's the institutions that are then channeling certain information. And uh, for me, a really super interesting example where it was de-siloed in many ways um, was during the Ebola response in, in, in West Africa. Uh, I was the chief of staff uh, for the special envoy of the secretary general for the Ebola response. So I was right there in the middle of everything that was happening. Um, and what was super interesting there was that um, there were weekly calls uh, where it was this sort of intersectionality that was, was happening, uh, where you had the ministers of health from the three most affected African countries that were on the call, you had the responders on the ground in those three uh, that would bring the information of what was happening, what was uh, possible. And yet the major donors and also philanthropies on the call from Japan all the way to the to the US in all time zones in between, uh, you know, if money or resources were needed, they would uh, come come in. You had academia uh, uh, there, some of the, you know, the foremost thinkings on epidemiology. Um, you had the uh, pharmaceuticals uh, there who, you know, were experimenting with the with the vaccine and, you know, and they, you know, were rolling it out. So they were doing ring vaccinations, you know, as soon as there was a case, you know, who they had been exposed to see and then that data would come come back in. Uh, but then, you know, then we would realize there would be anomalies, for example, if wait a minute, there's something is popping up, it doesn't make sense, what is it? And then the academia would be there to to inform and say, oh, wait a minute, it, it survives in the eyes. And then the foremost uh, expert on eyes would come in to, to see how Ebola could uh, uh, survive inside an eye. Um, and, you know, and then you had the U.S. military, you had the UNMIR, the, you know, the U.N. mission, you had all these different pieces. And to see that data and that information all coming together, um, I rarely see that in the in the in the in the data sphere. But you need something along those lines to have you know to have an effective response. Great, thank you, Monica. So you're, I guess, a producer, but you can challenge that. Let's see, maybe you're a consumer as well. Okay. Um... My name is Monica Dega. I'm the regional director, Eastern and Southern Africa, with humanitarian Open Street Map team. And we work through three primary primary avenues. The first one being that we um, advocate for and use open source um, tools in our work to support the creation of geospatial data towards uh, humanitarian interventions. Uh, the second one being that we are community driven. 
So we endeavor to build the capacity of local committees to actually contribute to um, open source data. And the third one is more of a mandate to continuously advocate for, um, yes, open source intelligence, but also that community generated data becomes a critical aspect or is integrated into kind of national systems that then result into um, uh, decision making at whatever levels. So largely we are, yes, a data producer in that sense, uh, but also a consumer um, from a perspective of how do we generate the kind of data that we, we put out there. Um, and the reason why I say a consumer as well is because over the years there's been a shift from um, um, data being used for um, as a supplement or as, a, as, as just an additional element to mainstream data sources. But we are seeing a lot more of data needing to be yes, integrated into the systems, but also community data being at the forefront of how we design different use cases of how we um, um, push for different decision uh, processes. And the consumption aspect of it uh, comes from um, one, um, the sources of data that then become the driver through which communities actually validate or ground truth data. So we use different tools and some of them involve, for example, um, uh, data from uh, satellite imagery, we adopt a lot of um, uh, AI generated data to help improve our models. And then that means the communities can then go ahead and ground through that data. They can go ahead and add additional information around a real life uh, challenge or problem. And then that combination or that integration then ensures that we're having holistic data sources that can help us sit in front of different spaces and be able to push for and advocate and show that this is why this data makes a lot of a lot of sense in the community. So and for for any kind of decision maker. So we operate as a producer of data, just special data, but also as a consumer in the sense that we adopt different technology tools from, from various partners. We uh, share data across different networks, the Missing Maps uh, network, uh, the H2H network, um, and all this then um, is, is geared towards ensuring that we are staying relevant as an institution when it comes to the production and the consumption of data. That's really interesting. Can I ask one quick one? Um, who is most resistant to community produced data among your kind of clients or stakeholders? That's a good question. Uh, and I would like to say all of us, and I'll try and break it down in terms of different levels. So um, there's still a lot of questions on the intelligence of community generated data. And this is because of um, contestability of you know accuracy, um, time when that data is collected. Um, there's several factors that bring about the, the 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 lack of belief or the the hesitation towards that kind of kind of data. Um, the in terms of the levels, it's the processes that we enforce to ensure that we can try and bridge the scale of our uh, um, disbelief or lack of lack of um, uh, buying into that data. And so where that starts from is if I start at the community level, the skepticism comes from our credibility as humanitarian institutions, uh, not in terms of um, in terms of uh, um, what we bring to the table, but also the relevance in terms of what is an actual problem for them at that particular time. And that is quite complex in that what we view as a challenge or as a problem is viewed very differently sometimes by the same communities. And I'll give an example of um, we do a lot of flood risk mapping. And sometimes for us, we are trying to um, enforce systems that can help a community be resilient. But most of the time they're thinking the flood has happened. I just need to know how do I move my few belongings, right? So any process that we're trying to introduce at that time is probably not speaking to their particular community. I think when it comes to decision makers, um, there's a role there in terms of um, continuously having conversations on ground truthing and validating of data. And from a very realistic perspective of it takes time, it takes resources, uh, it takes combining different data sources. So it's not just about the data that I've collected from communities. Um, there's also comparing it to national statistics offices data. There's comparing it to data that is in various different networks. So I would say there's the skepticism is across all of us, but I do think it's fueled by different perspectives for each person and how they're experiencing that credibility of the of the data. 
Thank you. We'll come back to a seal on that one. But um, finally, not last but not least, Paolo uh, makes many decisions. Uh, tell us how you make them. <laughs> well, I, as um, yeah, as the head of OTA in Mozambique, um, where I have to make a lot of decisions, and one of the first questions I ask when I'm looking at any issue is, what do we know about it? Uh, asking different people, but also looking at the data, because I think the data establishes a, 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 the, 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 the baseline by which we can then make decisions. And if I think, for example, about one of the questions I'm constantly asked is, why, why is OCHA in Mozambique dealing with natural disasters? Because natural disasters happen all the time in Mozambique. The international community has been investing in Mozambique for decades. Um, it's, uh, it's called a, a development darling, um, although that is also changing because funding is reducing not just on the humanitarian side, but also on the development side. And one of the information I use to explain is data. If you look at New Zealand last year, in January 2023, it had a huge amount of rain grounding the economic capital of the country to a halt for a, f a few weeks as a result of these heavy rains and the floods that, that, uh, that followed. Mozambique has that every other year. Every other year, a country that is 185 in the Human Development Index, whereas New Zealand is 16th, has this. And so it is important for us to recognize that while the engagement has been happening and it's been very positive from the IFIs, from the, the, the development donors, that the magnitude of what Mozambicans face year in, year out is of such a nature that we need to step in and need to figure out what is it that we can do to support them. And I think what is also important, and this is where data comes in, is we can look at what has happened historically, but is also to say, not uh, as was mentioned by, by Dr. Wendy yesterday, not just predict, but what is it that we want to do differently as we go forward? What is it that we can do so that we have a better outcome? We can help people faster. And that's not just about what the international community does, but how can we help the government that is in the, in the leading seat and they are acutely aware of na how impactful natural disasters are. Just a natural disaster last year, took away 4% of the GDP of Mozambique. Um, and so how can we help them do better? And I think that there's a role for the humanitarians in that because the humanitarian impact is huge, but also as a connector to bring together the efforts that are being made by, by, by so many to support and to work with the government. And just to demonstrate why this is so important for Mozambique, the president of Mozambique is the African Union disaster risk reduction champion and hosted a, um, a conference two years ago that led to the Maputo Declaration on early warning and the importance of early warning. And there has, there's been progress made in Mozambique. And I think it's also important uh, to not just become predictors, but also recognize that there has been um, change and positive change. So. One of the positive changes, and this is where um, I also also say also that data has to be put in con context very much. Last year, when uh, F uh, Cyclone Freddy hit Mozambique, and it hit twice Mozambique, Mozambique was better prepared. So there were much fewer deaths than had been the case when Idai and Kenneth hit the year before. And this is where data can become very cruel, because donors were comparing the data of fatalities in Mozambique with that of other countries, and Mozambique had fewer. So therefore, f uh, Mozambique had less support, less financial support, because we didn't have as much to show. And it, we, we had to have a, a, a discussion around the fact that indeed there were fewer deaths, but that's because there had been an investment on early warning that had produced better results for people, but the economic devastation the livelihoods that were destroyed, the fact that schools and health facilities were closed were having an impact on those who survived. And that that's what we needed to be looking at and looking at how to help donors make their case with their capitals 
on the uh, economic impact that this was having uh, on on people and and use that so i think it's it's about recognizing the positive change but also looking ahead and looking at what we can do and this is where the uh, investment on on anticipatory actions so the timelines to start supporting the people are much reduced from one month to a day and that's the kind of investment that we are looking at at uh, wanting to make in Mozambique so data helps us tell explain why this is important what has what positive has happened and how can we can continue to capitalize on the positive investments that the government of Mozambique has been making to address uh, the impact of of natural disasters without saying this is without saying that this is just a development issue it's also a humanitarian issue and we need to be better prepared be faster and be more flexible in what we are doing in in Mozambique thank you taking that example of the um the data can be the cruelty of data um is that an example is that an argument for not relying on data and in fact finding other persuasive messaging or is it that we're counting the wrong things and we miss we're missing it it um i remember having a conversation many years ago and somebody urging uh me to just start collecting data and said just start documenting so start putting the information just start looking at the trends and the patterns of the data so that you can use it when it's necessary and i thought well there's lots of things we can collect data on what are we going to collect data on what would be meaningful and i think it's it, it, it's the argument for me is not that we stop collecting data but that we start collecting the right kind of data or that we start looking at the sources of information and that realizing that there's a lot more than what we collect as humanitarians although I see huge value on what we collect as humanitarians but what are, what is the other information and who has it that helps us then communicate I think this is a great point Dirk data in of itself is meaningless I mean most people would look at the at the information look at excel tables and they don't know what to what does this mean for me we have to explain as humanitarians so what so what does this how can this information help us make better decisions in what is a a a a, a very a difficult situation where we have less uh, I don't believe in doing less with uh, doing more with less I believe doing smarter with less and how do we do use that data so uh, in fact it's not just about uh, our data uh, and our data is the result of of many others but looking at other data sources that helps uh, communicate and working with with the different uh, partners on what is it that they need in order to make the case uh, because we think we have the information but others may need others so and this goes into this how do we open up the discussion how are we more inclusive how do we engage with others on what their uh not going to say their data needs but what information needs they have and how can we help make the case uh, on what is uh, on what is happening great thank you um so can i just uh, very briefly yes because i you, you mentioned cruel data i don't think there is cruel data there's no friendly data or lovely data it's just data and it is indeed about, for me, a lot about about storytelling. Eh? How do you frame it? Because the same data that you, you men mentioned or you call cruel, right, is because that's how donors interpret it, right? Where you can also explain exactly the same data as a fantastic success story of the investments that have been made. And at the same time, make the case, you know, that there's still need for a lot of support given all the impact on you know the economy livelihoods uh, people services uh, uh, etc uh, so it's for me it is a fantastic example indeed from you know yes the data is is there um and so let's talk about donors what do they think is cool and hot in in data what about you Asil? do you have partners who want you to collect data on certain things 
Uh, yes, we have a uh, different uh, type of partners that using data produced by, by Palestinian Center of Statistics, such as World Food Program, FAO, Action Against Hunger, uh, UN Esqua, uh, International Monetary Funding, World Bank, uh, OCHA. Uh, we also exchange data with HDX. Uh, we uh, uh, we submit different type of data uh, in different. Uh, partners to different partners and now you have extra demand because of the conflict yes yes who's calling you who's calling you the most uh, apart from uh, yet or so won't leave any of them alone <laughs> no javier the first one <laughs> Abby, no, no. all right just for once yes uh also inside our country uh we have different calling from different partners, such as uh, ministry of finance um, ministry of um, health uh, also telecommunication, uh, we have um, also a uh, Palestinian central bank, uh, uh, we have um, also, um, uh, I think, Ministry of uh, Education also. And Monica, who, your group is very seems very successful in raising money from foundations and philanthropies and kind of non-state donors. What's the secret? I thought we just go straight to money now. Um, do we have the secrets? Um, that's still an open question. Uh, but what I have observed... You, you may have a secret and be unwilling to share it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But um, there's... There's different, um, let me say, um, approaches or, th uh, or things that, for example, the donors will look for in, in our context. So, uh, and we are very lucky as an institution, for example, with, the, with kind of the philanthropy approach, it's, um, you know, um, design, design programs that are rooted in the day-to-day -day kind of practicalities of, of the existing kind of challenges that we are seeing in the world, whether that has to do with um, climate resilience and adaptation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but one thing that I have boiled down to is across all donors, uh, institutional donors, there's, there's um, a shift towards seeing tangible use cases that are coming out of the work that we are doing. And that sounds very simplistic, but it also shifts us from data to information. So at that point, the data is not what is driving the, 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 the focus or the results that we are looking at. It's the information that um, we are able to derive from, from, from that entire process, from, from the different initiatives. So I've seen um, um, scenarios where it's um, how did this work uh, contribute to how a government made a decision. And I'll give an example of some work that we did in, in Nakuru County, which is in Kenya. Um, it was a very interesting um, piece of work in the sense that we brought in all the, the relevant foundations for generating geospatial data. Uh, we, we had the technology partner providing us with uh, satellite data that helped us to digitize an entire city. Um, so all buildings and roads are out there, open source available. Uh, we're able to bring in other kind of tools to uh, then validate that data. Uh, some pillary street level mapping, uh, flew a few drones to actually uh, validate some of that data, send our communities out to validate the data. Uh, but then the use of that data for the government was one, um, yes, flood risk mo modeling for the town, which is really prone to flood flooding but also it evolved further into supporting the government to actually seek additional funding to continue with their uh, county development work. So, and that's something that was completely outside of, you know, the initial project design, which was possibly linear, that we will do mapping and this mapping will help to build a flood resilience model. But the benefits of that outweighed it and um, years down the line, it's supporting other small development plans outside of what was the humanitarian context including, you know, green spaces, um, how the city is structured and, and things like that. So I do think there's, um, it's less of a focus on data, I think, from, from the donor perspective, but also more of how is this information, what's the story that's coming out of it, uh, what are the longer outcomes that we're seeing out of it, and how are they then preventing other, and what we call anticipatory um, 
challenges that we might see in future, whether that has to do with city planning, et cetera, et cetera. So that's been the observation. It's very interesting. The the unexpected benefits sound very, very attractive. Dirk, you run a team of 60 people doing clever things. Um, Monica gets the first cookie for saying AI, of course, but you know, feel free to tell us about your new initiatives. <laughs> and what do people want? Yeah, what do people want? Um, I mean, if I look at donors, but also at, in the sort of humanitarian community, um, they, want, they want to see quality, quality data, credibility, uh, ground truthing, as I, as I, as I meant, mentioned, and they really want us to break up silos. Um, of, uh, and then with that, uh, you know, the ultimate uh, proof uh, and, and evidence that they're looking for is impact uh, at, uh, at community level. So... But, uh, you know, which you now see still way too much, for example, is that, uh, you know, a lot of different organizations, different groups, they, they produce post-disaster uh, uh, damage assessments, uh, for example, and then, you know, often using very similar data sets. And, you know, and, and so that's just duplication. And what they're looking for is how that can come together. Um, and I think Natalie was here yesterday. I unfortunately missed her. Uh, speeches. I'm mean, she, sure she satellites and sandbags. Satellites and sandbags, exactly. Yeah, the big uh, Water at Heart of Climate Action program that uh, that we we launched. Uh, very large. I was very surprised that we were able to get that together. You know, 55 million uh, uh, over a number of years. Um, but the, the key there is indeed uh, connecting uh, uh, different actors and dis- different uh, data uh, sets along the value chain of anticipatory action. And so it brings together WMO from literally from the, the satellite data and uh, but also the measurements, uh, equipment, etc. at ground level, working very closely with national authorities, with methodological uh, uh, authorities, but also with the disaster management uh, authorities, you know, UNDR uh, coming in uh, from that perspective, also making sure they have the right policies uh, in place. We're working with the Climate Center, we're working with, with IFRC, we're working obviously with the uh, the, the national society on the ground to then link that whole chain onto tangible uh, action uh, on the on the ground and and you know I think it's interesting because it's it's an uh, unusual uh, coalition but it's uh, and we're still in the, in the in sort of early phases it's still within the first year so we still need to show that impact and evidence uh, yeah, we're not not there yet but you do see how interesting it is to break outside of the humanitarian mold more narrowly defined and really bring in all those uh, those those perspectives and make sure it's it's firmly nationally rooted so there's a sustainability piece and the ownership piece is uh, it's all locally uh, developed is building on what's already there and then strengthening that further but really those links between the different sectors between the different actors and making sure uh, it is locally rooted for local impact. That for me, that is in any proposal, anything that we are doing on the data side, that's the that's the crux. Paolo, when you're trying to put something together in Mozambique, is it the data that you need, or is it the politics, or the arm twisting, or the country director of another agency that is more important, or the minister? It's um, it's uh, uh, in. It's telling the story. What does this mean for people? And I think that that's what motivates us to get up every day. We heard a lot about that yesterday. We're dealing with a a a, 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 a world that's more complex, where there's less unity, where there's more politics. And I think that we as OCHA have a role to play. And I remember sitting in New York as the head of Middle East North Africa section with uh, weekly Security Council meetings and being told you're telling the story of the people from the ground directly to the Security Council. And maybe I shouldn't be talking about the Security Council as it's not functioning the way that it was intended to when it was established whenever 60 or more years ago. But at any rate, I think that's what needs to motivate us. And I think here's where we need to be flexible and understand what is happening. And we, we, we've been talking about localization and what does this mean from the local perspective. And I think back to the cyclone last year in Mozambique where ga- uh, the government of Mozambique had actually started a climate insurance program. And I'm still of the CNN uh, factor generation where, you know, if it got on CNN and it was on the news cycle for 24 hours, now the news cycle is uh, half a second, it's even shorter, it's no longer CNN that matters, but you still have that phenomenon. Where is it worse? What is happening? And the, and the 
main element to make a decision that the government of Mozambique was was asked to for, to trigger tr uh, the climate insurance was the cyclone um, level. When in fact, cyclone level is not what matters in Mozambique. It's the amount of rain that follows the cyclone when it becomes a tropical storm and it's traveling extremely slowly over areas that aren't pl prone to flooding, actually, because they're not in a river basin. And that is what causes the most damage. So actually what we need to be measuring is not the cyclone intensity, but the amount of water that is dumped. And as I mentioned last year, we had more water dumped in Mozambique than it did than when it, uh, um, than in Auckland when it was ground to a, to, a, to a halt because of the amount of rain that fell. We had three times as much rain uh, fall that normally falls over a six month period over a few days. So you can imagine what this meant for the local communities, what it meant to the harvest that was just about to be collected, to the health services whose um, um, clinics were, were damaged, and etc. And so I think it's uh, this is where the local knowledge is so crucial, and where we come in and say, I actually know what we need to be measuring, and that's what you need to be measuring, because that's what's going to trigger the climate insurance, when in fact something else that's a lot more meaningful. And we need to have the courage to say, actually, from the perspective of the people who are affected, who do need that climate insurance to be triggered, this is what we need to be measuring. And we need to look at what will it take for us to be able to measure that in a meaningful way. And if we have a problem there, well, let's throw money at that versus something else that is measured uh, in another way. So I think it's it's really is local knowledge and understanding that is crucial. And having spoken to uh, Gemma, who you, was in Mozambique for EDI and Kenneth, she told me, but that was the same thing in 2019. Why did, why, why, why did you do something else? And I, I, you know, data is neither cruel nor lovely, nor, but it helps establish facts. This is what, the, this is what we already knew. Why didn't you take advantage you globally, because this was not an OCHA decision, to use the knowledge that was generated at that time. So I think we have to have the humility to actually ask the questions and listen carefully to what people are telling us. Thank you. It makes me want to ask Asil about, uh, does everybody accept your data as facts? When your, your facts are contested, your facts are challenged, your data is criticized. How does that work for you? Uh, yeah, uh, we do, we do uh, a permanent dialogue uh, between us and the uh, users who take uh, our uh, data in Palestinian Center Bureau of Statistics uh, to meet their needs, uh, also to the uh, keep a pace with the latest development in, in uh, international evidence and also international practices, also global classification in different fields of statistics such as uh, social and economic uh, one. Uh, all of these uh, done to enhance decision maker to take a correct decision for everything that we can do. And if you're going to look towards the future, how will you strengthen your work so, so in the future? Uh, in the future, we want to make more analytical uh, 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 analytical uh, description also. Uh, we need uh, to focus in the statistical number that we are producing in uh, Palestinian Center Bureau of Statistics. You, you told me, and we were talking earlier, you're starting to do something on scraping so that you can get the data sort of more. Is that to get it more real time? Yeah. Different? Yeah. We started in a trade statistical, also in a price statistical. We uh, do an automation uh, for uh, every data that we collected from the uh, different type of outlets from different governorates. Uh, these automation uh, are uh, statistical tools. Um, uh, provided us uh, uh, less minimum times to uh, editing every data that we're collecting because there is a huge number of data that we're collecting every week and every month, especially for prices and also for trade statisticals. Uh, we are looking now for web scrapping for uh, different outlets that uh, provided uh, prices in their official websites, uh, especially in prices also. Uh, we starting that with you and Asqua. Uh, also, we uh, teaching everything about uh, using Python for that, um, and we will continue for other service. In this so that's kind of an unofficial source, a bit like Monica's work with community data. So, how do you, uh, Monica? How do you deal with when 
I, I was struck by your story of the people who've been flooded and they really didn't give a damn about maps because they've been flooded. And I wonder whether in Gaza or in other situations, you know, that we can come with our clever data stuff, but in fact, people don't want to hear it. You can be very kind of inappropriate, right? If you're ringing up your staff member in Gaza and saying, what's the price of oil? Uh, do they sometimes just <laughs> refuse? No, it's not no, relevant? No, it's not refuse, but uh, we need the time. You know, uh, everything is destroyed there in Gaza Strip, so we need uh, a new, uh, a new uh, sources to collect the data. Uh, we need uh, to develop our uh, uh, collection of data or how we can collect uh, all of these data uh, because uh, everything there is destroyed, totally destroyed. So we need the time. We need the time to make a listing, geographical uh, maps. Uh, also, uh, we need to uh, build an office there because our office is destroyed also there. So we need uh, to bring technical uh, devices, uh, a new one. Um, also, maybe um, our staff there uh, need to motivate them to return back to work. <laughs> Monica, do you think that the official statistics organizations are more accepting now of, of community-based and crowdsourced data? Or are they still a bit jealous? I, I don't think the word is jealous, but I do think they do have a high expectation of us in terms of how we we sort of engage them. Um, and um, the observation that we've made from the, the Eastern and Southern Africa region of HOD is um, time and context actually often determine how these relationships kind of uh, evolve. And um, the, we've, had, um, we've been very intentional, for example, about involving some of the statistics offices or the, the government agencies in even actual data collection. So um, capacity building some of their GIS, you know, teams or offices to be involved in data collection um, for them to kind of determine some of the use cases that keep on uh, evolving. So I do think there's, um, there's a responsibility for us in terms of how we we engage them, but also an understanding of, again, the the different strings that pull, pull, pull you know, kind of the, the two ends of the string. Um, and um, one example that I remember slightly outside of this is um, years back we had the um, the you know the the tax paying system that we use in in Kenya, and it's a system that is down when you need it the most towards around when you need to file your taxes. Um, and at that time, I was part of a very active community of you know open source enthusiasts. They had the time. And they said, you know what, we will talk to our government, it's our government, um, and see how we can solve the, you know, the end user, the back end problems that everyone seems to be facing. Um, and those conversations, they seem very positive. Up until um, the team presented, this is how the back end could look like. This is how you could manage traffic. You could host this in a different server. Um, and the feedback at that point was, we or you are oversimplifying tax issues. The tax issues are a lot more complicated. And um, so, and, and that story I still carry it to date in the sense that um, behind the scenes, there could be legal issues, yes, copyright issues, but also understanding that the end user wants something that works. I want it working now and now. I need to deliver this box of milk or or water package from this location to the next location. And I think that is where now the the government will tend to lose us in the sense that um, there's the aspect of we need to deliver, we need to serve our community, we need to save a life, we need to get somebody out of the water, et cetera, et cetera, versus the protocol of how this needs to get done, which is also important. So I do think there's um, the concept of time but also context and again a language a language conversation and sometimes those instances have worked where we've been able to bring both sides together and talking but in some instances they've been overtaken by time interesting okay we've got only a little time one last round i think of what you would 
if you could wave a magic wand, uh, what would you like to change? What would you like to do differently or see different, Paula? I think that one of the things, one of the my findings looking at data and um, is when I look at uh, how we plan and then what we end up doing, there's a huge difference. And we tend to do what we've always done. There's a sense of comfort. We go to the areas that we serve, that we where we already have partnerships, where we already work with uh, uh, with the authorities, with the communities. And while we say we want to do something, in in reality, we fall into patterns of behavior. And I think uh, as I'm listening to the futures thinking about uh, managerial, entrepreneurial, visionary, is how can we become more visionary? How can we say, what is it that we want to be going towards? It's difficult. It's going to in in involve change. It's going to involve not doing something, working with other people, but having that level of motivation, engagement, commitment, clarity, because we, we say in all our plans, uh, we have taglines, we are agile, we're flexible, we are focused on vulnerability, but the evidence doesn't always show that. Uh, and and the, the, the issue is not to say, well, you know, it's not, a, we're not being, it's not being marked uh, at, uh, you know, uh, doing really well, but it's about challenging ourselves and challenging our assumptions and what we are doing to be looking ahead and to be saying that's where we want to end up. And for, in order for us to be there, this is what it means to be agile. This is what it means to be flexible, building in into the grant agreements that looking at how can we engage more with communities. We talked yesterday a lot about safety. There is a fear of working and a, and, a, and a very reasonable fear of working in insecure areas, yet that's probably where we are most needed. So what would it take to build in the security mechanisms to be able to do, to, to, to go there? So I think that it's getting that high motivation, but also starting the hard work to get to where we want to get to. And I'm you know thrilled to be part of this panel because as I'm listening, I'm thinking, wow, how can we connect? What is it that, you know, the things that you're doing and how can we use that to help us do better as, as, as we go forward? The satellites, the sandbags, uh, the working with communities, working in very difficult situations and yet get that evidence that helps us make those decisions. But it really is about that, having that clarity and that uh, um, fearlessness, that courage to get to where we want to get to as a, as a community. I think that's, you know, as we look ahead, that's where I would like to go. Thank you. Inspiring. Dirk. Uh, let's see that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Inspiring. God damn it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's always one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think on the consumer side, it is is making the the interconnections uh, both from you know from very very global to super super local and making sure yeah, that that is connected, but also across sectors and data sets and different communities. For me, on the con uh, data producer side, uh, that is 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 the big challenge uh, I, I think, but there are huge opportunities there as well, and the impact will be exponential if we can if we can do it well. I'm personally most interested in the uh, data. Uh, consumer side eh, and to link it to to decision making and there for me it's to be really intentional about this golden triangle between data uh, people and money uh, and just to give a, a you know a very simple but really powerful example that I've seen in 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 reality was also in the Ebola response in in West Africa where CDC the Center for Disease Control and in the U.S. Pr produced what we called the scary graph, and it was a prediction of you know where the epidemic would go, and it, you know, and within basically in six months it would go uh, you know over a million deaths uh, um, globally, and especially in the in the in the region. It was powerful. It's strong. It was evidence based, but it didn't have the traction immediately. And what really mattered was that then Samantha Powers called for a Security Council meeting 
to present that scary graph. It was very unusual because it was always about peace and security. Why about a uh, you know a, a, a an epidemic, a, a humanitarian situation? Why would that you need a forum to discuss it? But she uh, insisted in informing. Hey, this is where the story needs to be told. But also, it was you know as I think it was somebody from MSF from Liberia who was sitting there with sort of this very blurry connection which makes it you know very apocalyptic but also very very real and you know was talking about family members he had already lost he couldn't even go home anymore he was at the clinic where they were short of all resources and people were dying left and right and basically he said for him please come and i'm not sure we'll still be here right and that was so powerful you saw the people sort of connecting the, the graph on one side and then the testimony on the other side and making sort of the connection between in reality and all of a sudden became very powerful and then the last piece was that then also uh, the u.s ambassador um, uh, samantha power said uh, i don't want to hear anybody say just from oh this is terrible and, and sort of make those diplomatic statements i only want to hear commitments from the people in the council and so there was where the money piece came in where people then made very uh, powerful pledges to uh, support and that was sort of the the turning point from, you know, letting this epidemic spiral out of control, despite the knowledge and the data, uh, to to really getting to action. So that's trying. I really want us to be intentional in what we do on data to let it land and have it have impact. Thank you. Thank you. Asil, final thoughts from you, please. What would you change? What would you like to see happen? First of all, I uh, hope to work to be stopped right now, especially in Gaza Strip, because there is a huge number of injured person and killed one, especially in women and uh, children one. Um, we wanted to visit Gaza also. We hope that because I visit them uh, twice, 2011 and 2017. It's a very nice place. Uh, we wanted to restart working there as soon as possible. Uh, we wanted to develop our uh, statistical by um, enhance every decision maker to use uh, the statistical number in a correct way. Uh, also, uh, we make different dialogue with them. Uh, we have a strategical uh, national uh, statistical one from 2024 to 2029, uh, focus on uh, using administrative data record in the future. Uh, building different units statistical in different institutions and international organization to uh, rechange and exchange uh, everything with them. Uh, we hope uh, funding to be continuous all of the time, not to shrinking or uh, to uh, end them. Uh, yeah, just, just, just this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's very, very good that you could be with us. Monica, final Final word goes to you. No pressure. Okay, yes. So from a humanitarian open street map perspective and from my perspective, um, I think what I'd like to see, um, and, and I think this this group or the spaces that we sit in can, can get to that is at least um, an understanding of what I call foundational data um, foundational map data, foundational first level of data. I do think that if there can be some form of agreement on that, then it makes it so much more easier for us to evolve and grow through the many proliferation of use cases that we are seeing. So um, how do we address the question of coordination? Does it mean that there's um, a starting layer of, of data and from there we are all able to journey or build the different use cases that will arise from that, whether that goes to um, the humanitarian sector or to the development sector. And I do believe that uh, some of that can be achieved given the advancements in technology. There are certain types of data we might not need to collect anymore. Uh, technology has kind of progressed us in that, in, that, in that direction. And that means then we can focus more on the, the validation, the ground truthing, etc. cetera. Um, I think the second one is, um, not investment, but um, more resources towards validation and ground truthing, particularly around anticipatory action. And uh, it goes beyond kind of financial resources into um, how we 
um, capacitate communities to actually um, continue to do to do the work and for it not to be a start and stop kind of process. Uh, so I do think there's an opportunity in terms of uh, resourcing towards ground truthing and validation, but way in advance before we are needing to make decisions after a disaster has happened. So that has to do with a lot more of anticipatory action mapping. Thank you. Well, um, I've enjoyed listening to you all very much. Thanks so much for your time and your insight. Maybe we could give our panel a round of applause.